What did you find? We found a biofluorescent turtle. Turtle. The first day I've ever seen. It. And it was so, it was just hanging out. We we're actually filming corals this one night. We're in an area that's just filled with crocodiles. And uh, we were a little bit nervous in this water at night. It was a, a, a reef that nobody ever really dives at. And, um, and then suddenly, right underneath the lens came a turtle. And um, it just lit up the camera, which is really tuned in to seeing biofluorescence. I think as a scientist, you wait your whole career for a few cool discoveries. And you hear all these stories of discoveries and, and you just don't know when it's gonna happen. And um, I mean, this moment was just amazing. It was something I was, we couldn't believe. My name is David Gruber. I'm a marine biologist and I work across many different areas of the ocean from microbes to whales and sharks. One of the real primary lines of my, of my research is to try to understand the ocean from the perspective of marine creatures. Just because I see something a human way, I can't tell for sure if a shark or a turtle sees it that way. One night, we found a fluorescent eel, and that was just miraculous. I wanted to keep going further and looking, so joined up with other scientists and we, we began searching the world and we found, you know, hundreds of biofluorescent fish. And that just opened up a whole new line of research. So we started with the eel and the eel, its entire body is fluorescent. It's just like one big green fluorescent um, entity. But we also found it in other fish, like this bream um, that doesn't have it all over the body. It's just like you know, on the head and the nape and these little racing stripes. And we could see it among these Acropa, Acropora corals that also have almost the same intensity and patterns of fluorescence. So that one, it looks to be some form of camouflage. And we found it in lizard fish, which are just totally different patterns. They come in green and red. We found it in scorpion fish, some of the most venomous fish, um, but also just very sedentary and sit on the bottom, but they also, sometimes they sit among the algae and algae is all red fluorescent. So all plants are actually red fluorescent. So having the red fluorescence and then being situated on top of some algae would, would provide it with camouflage for other fish that are super tuned into biofluorescence. But then we found it in stingrays and this was really cool because stingrays are part of car cartilaginous fish or elasmobranch, and that includes sharks. As we began to explore more of these tropical reefs, it also begged the question, well, what about the Arctic? You know, what about a part of the world that gets 24 hour sunlight some parts of the year and then darkness the other part of the year? What is happening under the, the water, under the ice? at these, how are, they, how are the fish communicating? What's happening there? So we planned a trip to Greenland and we found, you know, one, um, one outfitter that was able to, um, to bring us to a small ice camp where we based ourselves for several weeks and, um, and dove under the icebergs at night and found this beautiful little snailfish that's biofluorescent. And it was the first example of biofluorescence under um, in the Arctic. We began really looking further. It turns out that the snailfish is not only interesting because of biofluorescence, but it has all these antifreeze proteins in it. So its body doesn't freeze and it can live on a frozen iceberg. And it's got relatives that live in the Marianas Trench at beyond uh, 11,000 meters. So. It's like a family member that's at the surface and at the deepest parts of the ocean at the, you know, in the ice and in the most crazy part of the Hadal zone. Even though that three quarters of our planet is covered in ocean, it's been relatively inaccessible beyond the surface to, to humans for most of our history. So now that we can have access, there is a sense of responsibility and, and how we used it and how we, how we approach the deep sea, how we approach anything. I love the idea of 
finding technology that could connect us to life and um, just looking for examples of like, is there is there a way that technology can can have a more connective um, symbiotic relationship with nature, with life on Earth? The Earth is a finite place and, and we want to ultimately um, think of how we will live here for for many more generations where where the things that are here now are are here in the future <laughs>